Exploring the Bizarre. Your e-ticket ride into the world of the paranormal. Strap yourself in as we traverse the universe exploring the unexplained. UFOs, ghosts, lost worlds, cryptozoology, as well as other dimensions. It's time to take back the night. Now, your electrifying hosts of Exploring the Bazaar, Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz. Do you have the secret disclosure files we've been waiting for? <laughs> uh, da, comrade Timmy. Everything is here from the LSD to the mind crawl devices. Everything Mother Russia has requested is here in briefcase. Ah, uh, brother, Vlad sends his regards and well wishes and will be seeing you at the next election polling today. Ah, my goodness, the briefcase, the briefcase, it, 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 it's opening and all the information is, is, is falling out and it will soon be available to all of your listeners and I'm too frightened and I must go into the darkness again. You know that, Tim? That was... <laughs> I, I make a good se secret agent, don't I? Yeah. Boy, oh boy. Uh, yeah, yeah, next we bring in Moose and Squirrel. <laughs> well, I got Moose right here. <laughs> oh, 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 Goose. Uh, goose, not Moose. Moose. Moose and Squirrel. Yeah. Moose and Squirrel, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, now we can <clears throat> get serious uh, for the rest of the evening, right? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, I'm all I'm really serious, Tim. I know, I know. I always try to put a monkey wrench into this, don't I? Uh, <laughs> uh, any, any, anything to get the Hollywood crowd. That's what I say. Uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going. I'm going for a Tony Award next. Uh, hey, anyway, I why did leave you... it? <laughs> uh, what do you? What is, so what do you, what have you been up to this week? You've been busy working on uh, this book with me on the cryptozoology, the winged, weird winged wonders. Yes, yes, that's right. Well, and and it's just you know it's it's kind of a little bit of synchronicity there because I had uh, previously written an article for um, an Indiana-based magazine dealing with um, oh uh, uh, giant and flying snakes that have been uh, seen in Indiana in the past. So uh, I, I had already had some of this uh, wonderful research uh, uh, right here at my desk, ready to go for uh, uh, the article for this new book. Well, well, there you go. Hey, you know, why Why does so many weird things happen in Indiana? Oh, I don't know. I guess it's just a weird place. Well, what, what was that? There was an old TV show. Was it Erie, Indiana? Yeah, Erie, and Indiana. Erie, Indiana. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, see, they uh, they they realized even back in the uh, uh, early '80s, you know, what a uh, strange place Indiana is. Well, and and you know, we were just talking uh, earlier today uh, about the, uh, the spiritualist uh, movement and how we were going to uh, being uh, uh, submitting some. Uh, material to the uh, psychic news uh, over there in the UK, which has been published for, I think, over 80 years uh, now. Uh, it started out in the 1930s as a tabloid, and now it's a, a very shiny, glossy color uh, magazine uh, available at your local uh, newsstand. Well, actually, available at Barnes & Noble, let's be honest. There are no newsstands. Not but, anymore. Uh, yeah, uh, and anyways, the spiritualist movement had the great roots in... Um, uh, in Indiana, in fact, uh, near where you live, I understand. In fact, you told me that you had visited Camp Chesterfield. 
Yeah, yeah. The uh, Camp Chesterfield was in the uh, same county where I grew up. Uh, near, uh, uh, I grew up in Elwood, Indiana, and, and Camp Chesterfield was uh, in you know, Chesterfield, <laughs> just in the uh, in the same county, just uh, down the road. Though I mean, it was I didn't realize it was there till I was you know, a, a teenager and reading Fate magazine and all those other ah, uh, well, there fun you publications. Go. Right, there right. You go. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, the topic tonight is not uh, spiritualism, although. Uh, one of our guests uh, has written on the uh, the subject a very good uh, a DVD uh, uh, set in a book. Uh, but tonight we're we're getting into mind control and LSD and uh, a, a, a Nazi uh, secret societies and a whole different uh, ball game. Uh, and I think it's going to be a very interesting uh, a, a program here if we all don't die of the uh, flu. By the time it's over. <laughs> yeah, let's hope not. <laughs> uh, all, all, four go, all four go down now. <laughs> uh, anyway, Tim, tell our audience who we will be speaking with this evening. Oh, definitely. Well, tonight, uh, as as usual, you know, exploring the bo- bizarre brings in the the the, the best guests and the most fantastic uh, people for us uh, uh, to talk to and to learn new things from. And uh, we'll start out with uh, uh, Paul Davids, Paul Jeffrey Davids. So uh, we've known uh, uh, Paul for for quite a while, and and I'm trying to remember if we've had him on exploring the bizarre before. Uh, he's uh, he's been on uh, some of our previous uh, uh, incarnations of uh, uh, webcast, but uh, this may be the first time he's been on uh, with exploring the bizarre. Well, he he's on our YouTube uh, uh, channel, Mister UFO Secret Files. Uh, mm-hmm. We did an interview with him when he was in New York a couple of years ago, and about the um, a video that he did about Forrest J. Ackerman and the life on the other side. Right, right. Well, and that was a absolutely, absolutely fantastic uh, program, the Life After Death Project, uh, which was uh, shown on uh, the Sci Fi Channel. Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, tonight we're going to be talking about his new book called um, uh, Blowing America's Mind. And uh, it should be just, uh, as always, a fascinating conversation. And uh, also joining us tonight is uh, Olaf Phillips. Now, Olaf's been on the show before, and uh, as you know, he's a conspiracy researcher, writer, author, publisher, specializing in uh, things like uh, the secret space program, exotic aircraft, high technology, uh, mind control, all this other uh, fun mm. stuff that, uh, that we're really interested in, as well. Uh, uh, Olav is the uh, uh, publisher of uh, Paranormal Magazine, which has been around uh, for, gosh, it seems like uh, for, forever. And uh, uh, you can find uh, uh, more about uh, Paranormal at uh, Paranoia Magazine at uh, Paranoia dot com. Paranoia Magazine dot com. Sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah, Olav. I, I think we, I think we should also mention that uh, he has uh, contributed to this a book that we just published a week or so ago called Occult Secrets of the Third Right, Hitler and the SS, The Untold Supernatural Connection. And I want to get into that a little bit later on as well. Well, why don't you lead the questioning uh, off, uh, uh, Tim, and uh, let's find out about uh, the CIA uh, and LSD. (laughs) Well, yeah. Well, uh, Paul, uh, thank you for being with us tonight. Really uh, great having you with us. Tim, anybody who can hoax me to participate in the show at late hours is uh, got a magic gift that for you guys <laughs> uh, well i started to say seven o'clock there on the west coast that's not uh, that's not yeah, too late but, yeah that's late for me i've been keeping some really weird hours but uh you uh mentioned the name of the new book just out blowing america's mind uh it has a subtitle <clears throat> which is a true story of princeton CIA, Mind Control, LSD, and Zen. And why Princeton? Well, Princeton University uh, is where the story is set, where my co-author John Selby and I went to school. And while they are majoring in psychology, we discovered the research program at the nearby New Jersey Neuropsychiatric Institute. And our book is, it's sort of a true life one flew over the cuckoo's nest of 
what happened to us when we enrolled as guinea pigs in their research program in deep hypnosis and LSD. All right. Well, now, uh, how did you enroll? I mean, did, did they uh, put up uh, flyers on campus or, you know, have a classified uh, ad in the classified ad or something like that? I mean, you, you know, you would think that uh, uh, something like that, it would have been a, a little difficult for uh, a college student, even for Princeton, to uh, to get involved with. Well, they never told you what the goals of the program was, who was financing it what it was really about. And you mentioned flyers. Well, at Princeton, on the main thoroughfare, it's called uh, Nassau Street, they have mm -hmm. kiosks where students and uh, professors and interested parties put up ads for anything, uh, from a rock concert to a party to, in this case, they were looking for subjects to be paid and participate in deep hypnosis experiences. And it sounded interesting to me. I uh, asked around, and what I found out that really fascinated me was that Dr. Humphrey Osmond was in charge of the program. So who is Humphrey Osmond? Well, if you've ever in your life used the word psychedelic in any conversation, that's because Humphrey Osmond thought it up first. Mm. He was a psychiatrist originally from England. Then he went to Canada, where he began experimenting with mind-manifesting drugs like peyote with the Native uh, American Church. And then he came to head up the Bureau of Research at the New Jersey Neuropsychiatric Institute, uh, where he was continuing his research with the psychedelics, especially LSD, and hypnosis for what he called non-drug analogs to the psychedelic state, meaning using deep hypnosis to mimic what happens uh, on a trip, but also, and this was the uh, tough part of it, he was also using hypnosis to uh, mimic psychosis. Hmm. So you said we're gonna have a guest on tonight who has Paranoia Magazine. Well, they were interested in using hypnosis to induce paranoia and schizophrenia, split personality, um, psychological panic. Um, they wanted to figure out the difference between the symptoms of madness, uh, psychosis, and what happens to a person under a psychedelic drug. So. Hmm. That was the heart of that part of MKUltra. We can talk more about MKUltra, which was almost 150 different research projects, top secret. Uh, uh, Paul, uh, what, what, what year was, what year, are, years are we talking about here? Uh, mainly 1967, although uh, John Selby started in 1966. Right. Uh, that's the year that LSD was made illegal. Before that, it was legal. And people like Ken Kesey were passing it out in cities and Kool-Aid, the electric Kool-Aid acid test, you know, uh, everywhere they could go. And then things were shut down, but they weren't shut down at the New Jersey Neuropsychiatric Institute, which had a healthy supply of Sandoz acid from Switzerland, uh, courtesy of the CIA. This is what we did not know at the time, that the project we were part of was being funded by the CIA through a dummy corporation as part of their CIA mind control experiments. They had a lot of dummy corporations set up that were basically the paymasters, so the money couldn't be traced easily back to the CIA. Uh, one of the paymasters here was called the Society uh, for the Study of Human Ecology, which, what does that mean? I mean, it means, I, I don't think it means anything, but that was uh, the name they gave it, and that's whose name was on the checks. So uh, NIH was also involved, uh, National Institutes of Health, National Institutes of Mental Health. There was a lot of black, there was a lot of their funding that was funneled into black research projects that were top secret. And how do I know this? Well, it all came out about 10 years after we were part of the experiments. MKUltra was exposed nationally. 1977 or so, that was, there was then the uh, uh, a Senate committee hearing about it, 
uh, Ted Kennedy was part of it. And the hearing was kind of a whitewash. Um, this stuff had come into the public. Uh, documents had been exposed that Richard Helms, who had headed the CIA previously, had wanted destroyed. They weren't destroyed. They went public, and it was a tremendous embarrassment to the CIA. And that's when we began to see the names of our researchers, Neuropsychiatric Institute, who the funding parties were, what the real purposes were of what we were part of. And we also, John Selby and I, we wrote Blowing America's Mind together because we lived it together. Um, we also, at that point, got to see the enormous scope of the CIA's uh, mind control research. They used prisons. They used uh, well, so prisoners, soldiers, patients in hospitals, college students at colleges and universities, and people that they enlisted at private research uh, centers for their studies of about 140 different drugs. And then um, they also experimented on completely unsuspecting people. I mean, and according to one report, this included uh, going into a subway uh, and men with masks that would protect their breathing spraying LSD in the subway in order to see what would happen to the people that were passengers. Ugh. So rogue renegade operation that went on for many, many years and they justified it in Cold War terms because Russia was doing that kind of research. Mm. And then there was the brain, con the the my, what would they call it? Uh, brainwashing, they called it, out of uh, North Korea, the Korean War. Um, so, you know, they took advantage of the public, and we just walked right into it, John Selby and I, as unsuspecting guinea pigs. And the book is our true account, Blowing America's Mind, get you inside our skin as you uh, live what we lived. And, you know, we used all the real names. They're all dead now. We can use all the real names. We, we waited until everybody was dead, and then we published. Well, now, how, how did they keep track of your... Okay, so you would go somewhere, and uh, you, you knew that you were being uh, given the drugs, correct? They didn't always tell us that we were given a drug, and sometimes it was a placebo because they had a control group too. Mm -hmm. So um, you didn't know, or they wouldn't necessarily tell you that it was hypnosis plus a drug, but it was always hypnosis that began with training, training to teach you to go under very, very deep hypnosis, training to teach you to be responsive to a trigger word, which would induce the trance once you were relaxed in a in one of the hypnosis chairs in these hypnosis rooms they called cells and they erased memory they gave hypnotic conditions that changed perception of reality for hours at a time uh, they would wake you up when you were under a condition uh, you'd walk around, there'd be pe people taking notes on your behavior, asking you questions, but they would have changed your reality in a fundamental way during those hours. Then, before they would bring you out of it, they would erase your memory of what had happened during the previous uh, few hours. So it, it sounds incredible that they could really erase your memory of what had happened during, you know, the same afternoon. But with sufficient training, that happens. You have to appreciate that hypnosis can even be used as an anesthetic. If it's used by people who know how to induce the state in people who are susceptible to going under, mm -hmm. it can be very, very strong. So I think one of the most interesting things about our book, particularly what happened to my co-author, John Selby, who had been a subject for over a year when I got into the program. He was being elevated to being a training hypnotist. He was assigned to be my hypnotist at the beginning to teach me to go under. And during that time, he was having an enormous psychological crisis from the hypnotic conditions, from the memory blockage, from some of the things that they had done to him under uh, conditions that did involve drugs. So uh, 
listen, we've been at work on this, Tim and Tim, for literally uh, decades. We started it a couple of years after uh, we were at the Institute and had these experiences and weren't able to finish it then. We tried to finish it when MK Ultra was exposed and we kept at it through the years. But then without finishing it, John Selby and I went in two different directions. He became sort of a world traveler and uh, writer first of fiction and later of popular psychology. And I went to the American Film Institute, Center for Advanced Film Studies, and got into the entertainment business in, in Hollywood, starting working with a very famous agent and then onto the Transformers TV show, the animated cartoons, then was involved with Star Wars intensely with uh, writing six of the sequel books for Lucasfilm and then making Roswell, then making about 10 other independent films, one, or, one every year or so. Mm -hmm. So we, we went our two Including ways. one on Timothy Leary. Yes, it was one of the first. Mm -hmm. And that's a very important thing to bring up, the connection, because that film, which you can uh, find online, I think, yeah. Uh, the DVD is still out there. It may be out there for streaming too. I'm not sure on that, but it's called Timothy Leary's Dead, like the Moody Blues song. So yeah, about uh, 20 years after these experiences at the Institute, I got to know Timothy Leary uh, quite intensely during the last year of his life. Uh, his publisher sent me to him. And the fact that I had worked with Humphrey Osmond who he was associated with, you know, was a plus for letting me make a, um, a biographical feature film about his life as he was dying the last year of his life. So yeah, life for me had all these different dimensions, but blowing America's mind, the latest book, <clears throat> which, um, I think your listeners will find, uh, fascinating and very, very readable. Uh, that waited until the end of 2017 for us to actually complete and for it to make print. And of course, it's both print and an ebook. You can find it in any, you know, hmm. of those. A any, any, books. any chance a um, a video might spin off a of movie? It? A yeah. movie? Uh, y yes, there, there is. Uh, I mean, we haven't begun to solicit the interest in LA yet, but that process actually is going to start next week we'll see we we'll have to t see if there's somebody who uh intensely wants to make it and um and we'll just we'll see that's the way it is with every project you, you know you put things out there and you you never know where it's destined roswell took like four years of rejections to finally get made with showtime some of the best well we have our first break coming up and uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes and uh, we'll be bringing in our next guest and we want to talk to him about uh, the the Nazis and, and mind control and, and how this uh, all ties in with this big scheme of things to control world domination. Now back to exploring the bizarre with two of the most electrifying researchers in the paranormal. Your hosts, Timothy, Timothy Beckley, Beckley and Tim Swartz. I'm Hack Hard Drive, and this is the WikiLeaks song. I am a hack, hack hard drive. Make that professor to you, hack hard drive. Remember my name, I got lots of fame. I'm hack, hack hard drive. I'm professor. Hack hard drive, and now I'm all locked up. Julian, they threw me in jail. They think I'm clean out of luck. I hacked the wrong hard drive, and the files that I took, well, they're all filled with secrets. Come on, have a look. Hey, Julian, my friend, you're on a very, very tough road, but I've got two million secrets ready for you to upload. UFOs and chemtrails and lots of voter fraud too. Fukushima and plutonium 
Now El Diablo is through. And Ron, they've got the bomb. Do not wait, detonate. CIA controls your mind. Columbine, it's not so fine. 9 11, implosion. Nothing is as it seems. Conspiracies are not fads. This world is full of bad dreams. All right, welcome back to Exploring the Bazaar. And that was Hack Hard Drive. That's a good friend of yours, right, Paul? Yeah, that's one of my alter egos, uh, Tim. You know, somewhere along the way, I was in studio with uh, Brian Lambert, who composed the scores for three of my films. Uh, and uh, we started, uh, you know, just fooling around. And what came out of those sessions was the personality of Professor Hack Hard Drive. So I did a whole bunch of Hack Hard Drive songs uh, and the WikiLeaks song. Uh, in that one, as you, you hear, Hack Hard Drive is in jail and he's singing to Julian Assange as he's getting ready to send Julian somehow from prison. Another two million <laughs> secrets. <laughs> well, so we had a lot of fun with that. Uh, well, and we'll uh, uh, after uh, each break uh, on tonight's show, we'll we'll play uh, a, a different uh, hack hard drive song. Oh, just, great, uh, yeah, great. Well, that one that one is like a wet dream for conspiracy theorists. <laughs> that's it. Well, that's why I wanted that one first. <laughs> that was a good one. Uh, well, uh, Tim, why don't we uh, why don't we bring uh, Olaf Phillips uh, into the conversation now? I know he's been uh, uh, patiently waiting for uh, uh, for his chance for his for his day in the barrel, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll just slip him another dose of LSD. And, uh, we'll, we'll, well, we'll get him. We'll get him to reveal all the secrets. Won't maybe maybe maybe, maybe some psilocybin. That's a little easier on the system. <laughs> well, you know, I have to say, I've never been much for psychedelics my, uh, myself. But the one time that I did do LSD, I saw Jimi Hendrix perform. Oh. And you know what? And you know what I said? I said to myself, I don't think I need to go any further with this. <laughs> I, I mean, it, 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 it was as far as I'm concerned, it was the ultimate uh, experience. It, it was a good it, it was a fairly decent uh, d- a trip. And, uh, uh, you know, the notes, the, the colored notes came out of the speakers and uh, it, it was uh, the music just the wailed and it took me to another dimension. And I said, well, you know, like. Uh, the, the, this is this is as far as I want to go with it, and so that is the far as I went. <laughs> like it's not going to get any better than this. That, yeah, that's what that's what I thought, you know. And uh, uh, of course, you know, we kind of seen the the full circle here. Uh, of course, uh, marijuana was big when I was a kid, and then it was outlawed and illegal, and people were thrown in jail. And now it's uh, the, the recreational and medical and and all that. So we we do seem to be loosening up the <coughs> tabs uh, uh <laughs> somewhat i don't know do you think uh, uh, uh paul that uh, lsd will ever be made legal again or uh, uh, tested well yeah uh, you got to move the government to get uh to get a change of uh, any kind don't you the federal government on oh that well uh, they, they don't seem to be able to agree on funding the country or yeah. Who's a citizen, or yeah, yeah. which countries we to go to war with, uh, or what constitutes or, or what, or what a leak of you, or what bathroom you could use? What bathroom, Tim? <laughs> you know, there's a limited number of bathrooms you can use, Tim, given your oh, state of affairs. There uh, you go. Well, you well, know, New, it, York, New York, New York. We have uh, usually the bathrooms anybody could use them. You know, because nobody's going to put in. The, nobody's going to spend the money to put in two or three. You know, I mean, so uh, it uh, one one uh, one fits all, so to speak, uh, pretty okay. much. Yeah. All right. Well, that's because it's New York. But you asked a serious question, and yeah. my serious answer would be, I hope so. I don't think it ever should have been made illegal in the first place. And, I mean, they not only took it away from the public, they took it away from the scientists, doctors, researchers who were doing constructive work with it. And, you know, and, and Humphrey Osmond's work uh, probably comes under that uh, category. I mean, he wasn't an evil uh, person in the experiments he was doing. He had legitimate purposes. We just didn't know that by being part of it that there would be the good trips and the very bad trips. And that's well, let me, we... let, 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 me, let me ask uh, all of this. Now, uh, you worked on this uh, book with us, The Occult Secrets of the uh, Third Right, which just uh, came out. 
what what is the history of 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 mind control? Uh, I mean, are are you are you familiar with how this all got, got started? I mean, was it the Germans that started mind control, or does it go back before that? Olaf. Olaf, are you there? Did we lose him? We got him under mind control. See that? <laughs> the, the CIA has moved in quickly and shut him down before he could open his oh, mouth. I'm here. Oh, there he I is. On mute. Yeah. Oh, he's on mute. Okay. <laughs> okay, so mind control in Germans? Well, you know, yeah, they, well, um, where, when did mind control start? I mean, who came up with the concept uh, that we could control our, other people's <laughs> minds? Well, I would argue to you that it probably started in the 19th century because, you know, you had a lot of hypnotists. You know, in that time, you had a lot of people experiment, experimenting with various kinds of drugs in the in the early, earlier part of the, you know, it's the 20th century and the late 19th century. So I would say probably then. The Germans did do a lot of experiments, especially at the concentration camps, uh, where they would, <clears throat> I mean, they did a lot of experiments across the board. There were, you know, atrocities, but they... They definitely experimented with various kinds of drugs, you know, and, in, and artificial blood and all kinds of crazy stuff. And, and what 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 were they through the use of mind control? What were they trying to do? Did, were were they using using mind control on their own troops as well to to get them to be superhuman? Not that I'm aware of. I think um, for the most part, their own troops were pretty bought into the ideology. Um, they kind of brain. I mean, they did a lot of. Not so much like mind control per se, like drug induced mind control. I mean, you, you do see, you know, massive propaganda and that kind of, you know, mass scale um, brainwashing. I think they did do yeah. a lot of brainwashing, but I wouldn't say like straight mind control, like an MK Ultra kind of mind control. Mm. Not that I'm aware of. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. But I mean, but in you know, in the case of their experimentation. They experimented across the board. I mean, they used to they used to take people from the concentration camps, put them in vests, and hang them from the ceiling like they were in a parachute, and then they would mess around with the air pressure to see when they would, you know, their when they would die, so that they could see how high they could push the loops off of pilots before they would die. So they would do it on inmates and uh, concentration camp victims before, you know, they would go out to the loop flop and say, "Well, your ceiling is now 11,000 feet or whatever." So they did some pretty horrific stuff. Now, did did the the mind control? We, of course, the movie The Manchurian, the candidate was was popular. They still play it on oh yeah on on t TV and all. And uh, of course, I was uh, a guest uh, many times on uh, uh, the Long John Neville show, and uh, Candy Jones, his fifth oh. wife, uh, was the uh, was the host that the uh, you know uh, after he got very ill and would only occasionally come on the air. And uh, there's a, a, a book out about her where supposedly she was used uh, as a, uh, uh, I guess, what, what is the word that I'm looking for? Spy? Or uh, uh, she was induced to do these things under... Like a, uh, cour you know, like a courier, courier almost. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, yeah. you know, it, it's something she never she never really talked about this. I, I, in fact, I didn't really know about um, uh, her involvement in this. And, of course, some people say, well... Mm -hmm. The whole incident was, uh, you know, uh, made up. Uh, it was Long John trying to be right. uh, a hypnotist and all. I, I don't know. I can't say because we talked about a lot of other things on the air, but we never discussed. We never really discussed mind control. And I guess if I had known about it, I would have brought it up. But it wasn't something that uh, particularly interested me, and I don't think it got a lot of attention uh, at the uh, the time. But now. The uh, Korean War, I guess, uh, was uh, more heavily involved in in mind control by both sides. Uh, is that correct? Right, that's correct. In and, fact, and, and, uh, Walter Boart wrote a book called Operation Mind Control. You know, where he gets into that kind of stuff about the trauma-based mind control and how some of those things are done. And all of it in, in the. Um... Toward the end of that book uh, by Boart, uh, he has an index where he lists 139 different drugs that they were experimenting with under MK Ultra. And if I sure. could just jump in for just a second, because MK Ultra did sort of take off in the early 1950s and went uh, deep into the 1970s, but some of their objectives, um, you know, they were very interested in finding a drug which could 
cause enemy soldiers to decide to just lay down their weapons on the battlefield and stop fighting. And that oh, was sure. yeah. one of the things that they were thinking about for LSD. Could it do that? And they, they did army experiments, and they found that absolutely uh, soldiers would uh, disobey orders. They wouldn't even pay any attention to orders uh, well, they, when they were under the influence. There was that, and then there was also their desire to find the magic bullet, let's say, uh, that could uh, cause retiring uh, CIA agents who had a lot of classified knowledge uh, to have their memories wiped clean, you know, like wiping out a hard drive, uh, and so that uh, they wouldn't remember the information once they retired. That was another of their goals. And well, we, also uh, interrogation. You know, yes, when you look at something like op Operation Midnight Climax, you know, they, they would, it was a CIA operated brothel and they would get the Johns and it kind of devolved later into a, more of a sex warfare kind of situation. But, you know, initially the logic was, <clears throat> I believe Olson, Frank Olson ran it, but the, the logic was, They'd bring these guys in, and then they'd offer them water, and the water was spiked with LSD. And then, you know, they were observing through a two-way mirror. And once the John was tripping, then they would come in and interrogate him to see if they could, you know, get information out of him and, you know, how lucid was he. You know, from what I've read, it didn't work so good. <laughs> but, you know, they also definitely try to use it as an interrogation tool. Uh, well, now, um, Olaf, what about? Um... Uh, a, a project uh, paperclip. I mean, were any of the scientists that were brought over uh, at the end of the war, I mean, uh, were they and their their knowledge used by the uh, the CIA in the early uh, MK Ultra developments? The name the name escapes me. And Paul actually probably knows them, but the name escapes me offhand. But there were a couple that were brought in to do that kind of stuff. Um, you have to remember is that when they did paperclip, you know, it was a race to stop the Soviets from doing the same thing. And, you know, so they pretty much just went and got all the, the you know, the kind of nasty people they could find that, that had the information that they wanted or the knowledge. They pretty much just scooped them all up. So if there was somebody doing experiments in the mind control, there was somebody, you know, experimenting with various kinds of drugs and interrogation and other things, they definitely picked them up. There, there are two that I seem to remember that they were doing more like interrogation stuff, mm -hmm. but their names escaped me offhand. There was Sidney Sydney Gottlieb, Dr. Gottlieb. Sidney Gottlieb. Yeah. yeah, he was put in there charge of the program by Richard Helms. And Helms became head of the CIA. Uh, it was around the mid-1960s. He had resurrected some of the MKUltra projects that uh, – that they had begun to let gather dust, and he pointed he appointed Dr. Sidney Gottlieb as head of all the MK Ultra projects, and it becomes a very interesting story. We we you know in blowing America's mind, the history of all this is uh, it's peripheral to it because we're mainly telling our personal story of what it was like to have been uh, part of it when we were at Princeton, and. And Princeton and Columbia University and Harvard University were all universities that were used for some of these experiments. But, uh, you know, at the beginning and in the, in, the, in the epilogue, we deal with some of those uh, facts that came out later that, for example, that uh, Richard Helms had ordered all the documents on MKUltra to be destroyed. And they weren't. And nobody knows why or who arranged for that. But... There were 20 boxes of documents on MKUltra, which doesn't cover everything uh, by no means, but it gave a huge window into the whole scope of the project once those uh, documents uh, were discovered. And they were all in boxes mislabeled as financial documents for some other project. So it wasn't until Helms was out at the CIA, Helms had lied to Congress uh, in the Iran-Contra uh, situation. Uh, he was uh, severely uh, punished by Congress. I mean, he was given a $1,500 fine. You know. Oh, gosh, wow. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> Poor yeah. And guy. Then he, was, he, he was out at the CIA, persona non grata, and then in comes Stansfield Turner, who I think was a Navy admiral. Uh, yeah, he was an admiral yeah, in the Navy undercover. Yeah, uh, well, and Carter 
the President Carter was a Navy man and, and brought him in. So Stansfield, uh, uh, Turner's uh, goal was to sort of wash his hands of all this stuff once it came out and said, look, this wasn't our CIA that, that did this. We, it stopped. It's not happening anymore. We'll try to prove that one. <laughs> Do you believe that, Olaf, <laughs> with your uh, research? Oh, no. <laughs> no. Uh -huh. And actually, what's interesting, when you were talking about the documents, you know, obviously, I have some of an interest. My my um, editor is actually the, the one who does most of the mind control stuff. But I came across a um, like an index where it has every single MKUltra subproject. Um, yes. I think for the most part, a lot a lot of the people that that ran it, they're redacted, but it has the summaries. It has the drugs that they used. I mean, it has everything, and it shows you, you know, when you're talking about these things were mislabeled and never destroyed. You know, the fact that somebody put that summary table. I mean, that's like a, a map to MK Ultra. Yeah. Somebody put this in a box and mislabeled it. I mean, you know, you have to wonder that there's some sort of thought behind that. Yeah, you know, absolutely. somebody definitely was thinking about this because that if you're going to destroy anything, destroy the indexes, destroy the things that tell you what all the subprojects are, you know, destroy the, you know, the, um, the updates and the, you know, the various memos between the subprojects and the main, and they didn't get destroyed. So it's, it's definitely very weird. Yeah, it was uh, it, it was intended to be planted there to eventually uh, be found, you know, one of the things to emphasize is that when this was exposed, and I think that was 1977, uh, it was headline news in all the newspapers across the country for, uh, you know, let's say for many, many days until they kind of shuffled it aside. But the title of the book that I wrote with John Selby, Blowing America's Mind, comes from uh, the headline of an L.A. Times editorial in that period. Uh, they published an editorial saying the CIA blowing America's mind. And they made the point that the nation, they said the nation's uh, powerful secret intelligence agencies are, uh, uh, how do we stop them from working to destroy the very freedoms that they were set up to defend? And that is part of the point. What do you do when you have... You know, when you have sort of a, a lethal cancer growing in the body politic that is uh, working its way into civilian uh, institutions like regular hospitals and dealing with regular patients and Ivy League school students. I mean, when you think about Columbia, Princeton, Harvard, uh, the New York Times published an article. We have some of these articles in Blowing America's Mind, but we, on the back cover, we have this headline from uh, New York Times, August uh, 26, 1977. The CIA tells Columbia and Princeton of secret behavioral research. Well, it's explosive because, I mean, what are we to believe from that, that these universities didn't know that this research was going on at their own universities? Mm that professors and researchers were taking money for this. Uh, I think uh, at a high administrative level, they, they did know. And this is one of the interesting things that John Selby and I address, because there's a terrific chapter, if you'll permit me, in our book, of John Selby uh, confronting Robert F. Goheen, who was then the president of Princeton University, about all of these issues and about LSD and its use on campus. Um, and John Selby got into trouble for disclosing information that he had uh, through the Institute about uh, LSD use uh, and marijuana use at Princeton. And uh, it got into uh, the New York Times and, uh, you know, it was a huge embarrassment to the university at that time. And they were trying to contain all this as a problem. And here was John Selby. Uh, who they viewed as a kind of a, uh, a, a betrayer, uh, while Cannon couldn't keep his mouth shut. And they sort of uh, isolated him at that institute. I mean, uh, he didn't take classes his final year. It was all at the institute. They gave him a diploma, but they sort of got him out of the way. It was fair. And there I was, the younger guy, 
naive about all of this. What did I know? I just walked right into the middle of it, volunteered mm. to be a subject. I was being used. I was enjoying, you know, being a part of the uh, Institute to some extent. But uh, but then uh, then came the dark side, you know, and I we, we both got to see that, too. And the book builds to the climax where John Selby flees from Princeton to go to California uh, without finishing his courses, without taking final exams. And yet they give him his diploma. Um, it was a big, big spider web of interconnections, spooks, men in black were there looking in on our lives, even after it all happened. And, you know, we spent years uh, sorting it all out. When, how about how about the, the rumors that some people might have even been uh, uh, assassinated or killed because they knew or were going to talk about this, like uh, Dulla, uh, John Foster Dulles? That fell. Uh, wasn't he the one that uh, fell out of the? Uh, no, there's hospital? another. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 no, that was. Yeah. Aren't you Foster thinking Dulles. of Frank Olson? No, that was Forrestal. Forrestal was pushed out of the window yeah. of, of Bethesda Naval yeah, Medical yeah. Hospital. Yes. And then Frank Olson later, out a window under the influence of LSD. They're doing a, a TV series now based on the Frank Olson uh, story. Somebody could come up with the name of the series. What is it called? <laughs> uh, we know we got Stranger Things, which is a fictional version of all that. But uh, is it something like that? You know, but... <laughs> it'll come. It'll 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 come to me. There's one about Frank Olson. But yeah, people killed over it. What was the name of the CIA agent? Was it uh, CIA head? Was it Casey, who had served as head of the CIA, and then he didn't he drown? Does anybody know that story? Holy. Colby. Yeah, Colby. Not Casey. Colby. Yeah, he went out. He, yeah, he had gotten out of the CIA and then he, uh, he had retired. And then he, one day he went out for a, uh, a canoe ride, I believe. Yeah. And then he, yeah. he just never came back. Yeah. There's, there's yeah. actually a really great documentary his son made called, I think it was like Finding My Father, where he tries to figure out exactly what Colby did. I <laughs> I'll tell you, so those who want to know why John Selby and I waited so many years to uh, complete and publish Blowing America's Mind, <laughs> you've just heard some of the reasons. We waited till we thought the coast was clear. You know, <laughs> yeah. statute of limitations is up, right? Maybe not. <laughs> All right. Well, our statute of limitations are up for uh, this section of the show. So uh, when we come back, we'll continue our conversation about mind control, MK Ultra, and other devious things on Exploring the Bizarre. Exploring the Bizarre. bizarre. Your e-ticket ride into the world of the paranormal. Strap yourself in as we traverse the universe exploring the unexplained. UFOs, 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 ghosts, ghosts, lost worlds, lost worlds cryptozoology, cryptozoology, as well as other dimensions. dimensions. It's time to take back the night. Back the night. Now, your electrifying hosts of Exploring the Bazaar, Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz. Despise you, you stink. 
Don't grace our side again. Get the hell out of here. Don't you come back again. Go! We love you. 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 You're so dear. Be near. We need you. We need you. We love you. We love you. You're great. You're talented. It's amazing! You're incredible! <laughs> that sounds like some of my uh, past relationships, Paul. Huh? <laughs> it's a little bit inspired by Charlie Sheen, all right? <laughs> ah, okay. I was going to ask you what the inspiration was. Well, the whole <laughs> Hollywood uh, concept of one minute, boy, they really need you. You're making money for them, and then out the door, you know? As soon as they are, you're not doing it for them anymore. They get rid of you until they see how much money you're making for somebody else, and then they love you again. So <laughs> that that song was the one take wonder. I mean, it was completely improvised in a studio in Nashville. Again, I was Professor Hack Hard Drive and uh, I had that concept and we just rolled with it without any rehearsal, without the words being written down. It was pure studio improvisation and Dr. Demento loved it, right? Maybe it was one of the most demented songs he'd ever heard. <laughs> oh, I I have to admit that's 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 one of my favorites as, as well. And I thought you know when you said that you know the, during the break, uh, I thought I'd remembered hearing that on on Doctor Demento. But mm -hmm. uh, well, um, getting back uh, to uh, what we were uh, discussing, mind control. Um, a lot of the emphasis that we have been talking about has to do with the LSD aspect of it. Uh, but um, hypnosis, as as you had said, uh, really plays a very large uh, a part in all of this. And I think a lot of people really underestimate um, how powerful hypnosis uh, can be. I mean, you know, there's, uh, and I don't know if it's, it's truth or fiction. I always suspected it wasn't true. You know, they say that, you know, you can't get somebody to do something that they wouldn't do under normal circumstances uh, using hypnosis. Yet I have read a number of, uh, and, and researched a number of cases where that has been proven to be, to, to be wrong. You know, it, it's a question of the technique of how you go about doing it. Uh, you don't uh, get somebody to do something that's against their basic personality and will by sort of directly ordering them to do that. Um, but you do it by creating a series of unpleasant symptoms for them uh, so that uh, it steers them toward a behavior that you want. For example, in Blowing America's Mind, the head hypnotist at Neuropsychiatric Institute, in New Jersey, uh, Dr. Bernard Aronson, uh, frowned upon the uh, relationship that John Selby, my co-author, uh, got into with a girl that John Selby decided he loved. And the institute felt that that would diminish their control over him. Hmm. They were grooming him. They wanted him there full time the following year. They were promising a draft deferment. Uh, it wouldn't be sent to Vietnam. It, the work he was doing would be in the national interest, but they didn't want this woman in his life. So if you give somebody a condition that they're going to get nauseous in the presence of somebody else and throw up every time they're with her, or she tries to get intimate with him and you know he's going to have a, a bout of, of nausea, it would tend to harm the relationship and make him go in the other direction, even though that isn't what he wants. So see, that's just one example of how to do it. You can create a whole series of symptoms with uh, hypnotic uh, conditions to elicit behaviors where you're trying to control somebody else. That's, you know, that's... I actually saw... Oh, go, go ahead, Olaf. Well, I was going to say when I, I used to live in England and when I was living in England, I actually saw a very interesting uh, documentary done by a guy named Darren Brown. It, it was called the heist. He actually brainwashed uh, four people to rob an armored car. And the way that he did it was very subtle and very, and slow. And he, it was partially hypnosis, but partially like positive feedback as well. So they, he instructed them to go steal a candy bar from a local shop 
and they did it. He picked them very carefully. You know, he weeded out a lot of people and they picked them for their psychological characteristics and he got them to do it. And then he gave them positive reinforcement for having done it. And over, over quite a while, he actually conditioned them that when they heard a Jackson five song, they would get agitated and then they would go and rob this armored car. And he actually simulated it. And then it took him like three months to deprogram them. Very interesting. Wow. <laughs> That is, that's, that's amazing. I saw, uh, it was, it was last year there, it was a security cam footage of, uh, and I think it was uh, maybe in, you know, in, in Europe, um, of, uh, this, this guy, uh, robbing a store, uh, but, uh, he did it through some kind of hypnosis and you see this guy, he's talking to the shopkeeper and he's, he like repeatedly touches the guy on his shoulder, you know, like maybe touches him on, his, on, on the chest. Uh, are you familiar with that, Olaf? No, but that's, that's actually apparently one of the ways that you can introduce the suggestion is that when you say a specific word, you touch the person. So you may say an entire sentence, but when you say a specific word, you touch them. And over time, they become conditioned to that. That's actually one of the methods. Uh, well, okay. Well, that makes sense then, because then you know, after <clears throat> after talking to this uh, you know shopkeeper for a little while, the shopkeeper just went and opened up the cash register and gave this guy uh, the money, and he left. You know, now I don't that's know if maybe. Whole, Go ahead. That's the whole concept of neuro linguistic programming as well. You know that you can use keywords to basically program somebody. They uh, did that. They did that in our case at the. Uh, New Jersey yeah. Neuropsychiatric Institute. Oh, tell, tell us. And in, in, in Blowing America's Mind, uh, we show, you know, exactly how they did it. And uh, the, the first step is, as I said, conditioning somebody to go into a trance based on hearing a keyword that's been set up with them and established, but that their memory of that, of that word is uh, obliterated. So part of the training uh, has to do with their attempt to instill a word that is a trigger word and try to block your memory of it and see whether it works. And at the beginning, you know, with some subjects, uh, you know, they may remember it or it may come into their mind at a later time. And then they begin to uh, be suspicious about how they've been conditioned to that word. But the more they do the training with people that are susceptible to hypnosis, they do get to a point where the memory is just absolutely wiped out on that. And then they control you with a series of trigger words. People have asked about <clears throat> training assassins, which I think they called Project Artichoke. It was an offshoot of MK Ultra, <clears throat> And they've, they've asked me, well, you know, were they training assassins at the New Jersey Neuropsychiatric Institute? Was that part of the Princeton, you know, was that going on? And uh, my answer to that is no, because for that program, they, they, they weren't looking for uh, star Ivy League students. They were looking for uh, loners, for people without family connections, uh, people who could sort of be... <laughs> made to uh, disappear in society and no one is going to be, nobody's going to be going looking for them. Um, but it, it was one of their goals. They were attempting that. And a lot of people have asked questions about some of the major political assassinations of our lifetime, particularly the Robert Kennedy case with Sirhan Sirhan, yes, sir, mm -hmm. where he claimed not to remember anything after he shot Robert Kennedy. So... Yeah, and there's the so, whole catcher in the right thing, though, with like Sirhan Sirhan and Mark David Chapman and some of the others, that, that when they complete the task, they have on them somewhere a catcher in the rye, and in some cases, supposedly they sit down and actually re catcher in the rye until the cops get there. But catcher in the rye seems to be, you know, something that's uh, very popular, you know, in these, these kind of assassination scenarios, that they always seem to have some connection to catcher in the rye. They have it on them. They had just read it. It's their favorite book. But for some reason, there's always a linkage to Catcher in the Rye. Poor J.D. Salinger, who created such a masterpiece in that book. <clears throat> but, of course, it's a and book then, about you know, a loner. About, you know, he's kicked out. Holden Caulfield is kicked out of school. Mm -hmm. He's wandering. He's trying to find himself. He, uh, he, he lies all the time and can't stop himself from lying. He's a, he's a 
he's a kid out of control and it is a favorite book for you know the disaffected before that it was uh, jack kerouac's on the road um right but, but yeah yeah you 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 make a good point and they tried everything with this they had a lot of money mk ultra was top secret so ask yourself with all the secrecy we have today because it's only increased since then right it hasn't diminished it's gotten more and more sophisticated and now the concept of somebody being a leaker, you know, if you leak something, uh, you, you know, they're all over that leaker, you know. And um, so um, you ask yourself, how, how could we ever know what's really going on today, given how everything is classified? Well, uh, you, you know, know it, uh, it's the, impossible. Oh, yeah. It's impossible. Uh, well, the the thing that occurs to me though is uh, you know especially there in Princeton and 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 some of these other Ivy League schools it makes me wonder whether or not see there you go um, if they were looking for possible influence on future movers and shakers uh, in society you know yeah. uh, a high you know high businessmen politicians. Well, that's, things that's like the Manchurian that. Manchurian candidate, right? Yeah. That's the idea behind the Manchurian candidate, right? That they they did trauma based mind control and conditioning on the guy. Then they you know, they release him back <clears> in <throat> and he becomes a war hero and then he escalates through the system. You know, so the Manchurian candidate is a model of that. Mm-hmm. Well, well I'm you know, sure they did stuff like that. Just well, watch telephone, one, you know. <laughs> moving it one moving it one step even further. I mean, we hear a lot of the uh, these people who say that they've been abducted or had contact with uh, UFOs. That something, some key word or some phrase or something has been planted in their mind, and that they will all awaken simultaneously at some time in the uh, in the future. So uh, well, it, it could in it the could peep po- of the owls. Yeah, it, yeah, it could peep of the owls that they see owls in. It, it could po- it could possibly be that uh, you know this is something uh, is something that is not just uh, earthly in origin. Let me let me ask you a question because I raised the issue of how impossible it is to unravel what's really going on today in any area of uh, these affairs. What, you know whether you're talking about the UFO uh, issue or. Uh, international events and, and conflict and uh, and the dance around approaching having wars <clears throat> and to get a handle on what what's really going to happen uh, and I want to ask you the question what you think on this uh, false alarm happened in Hawaii uh, announcing that there was a an atomic missile headed toward Hawaii and panicked everybody in the state for what was it, 20 minutes or half an hour until they said, oh, it's minutes. a mistake. It's a mistake, right? It was a mistake. Somebody, somebody goofed, right? Somebody goofed. But then just one or two days later, then the same thing happens in Japan, right? Oh, somebody goofed again. I mean, these are, these are mistakes that we haven't seen, you know, the last 20 or 30 years. And we get two of them in like a series of three days, right? So... And the first guy in Hawaii who um, it was blamed on, oh, he said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. And they didn't fire him, but they moved him laterally to some other job. That's what I read in the paper, okay? Yeah. How suspicious does this seem? How many people think that those were really accidents as opposed to planned tests, psychological tests, almost like a mind control situation to see how the public is going to react because as they <laughs> make approaches toward possible war, they want that. That's information they need. They absolutely need to know if the public is going to panic, what are they going to do? Right? So, well, they, they probably, yeah, accidents? well, they've mm-hmm. been probably doing that too on, on occasion with the, with the UFOs, uh, by uh, creating uh, false uh, scenarios. Well, in fact, we know... Uh, uh, Who are the worlds? Because the first one back well, in the 1930s. Yeah, yeah, but there, there was also the... Um, not the Robinson Committee, but there was the uh, the famous think tank, tank, and they did a whole scenario on, uh, uh, you know, on, uh, on UFOs and, uh, 
and, and what the reaction, uh, you know, would uh, would be. So obviously some of these uh, uh, sightings, I don't know, the uh, the ones that come to mind, of course, are the Phoenix Lights and all that were uh, seen by uh, so many uh, people. I mean, you know, you can't say for certain, uh, you know, what what's going on here. Is this some scenario where whether the... Uh, the CIA or the secret government or some foreign agency is, is trying to see what reaction, uh, how people would reaction if there was uh, either, a, a, you know, an open alien uh, contact or whether whether they could use it to manipulate the people's thinkings on a lot of different uh, uh, subjects, like the recent uh, disclosure in the New York Times. I mean, there are some yeah, uh, people who think <clears throat> that... Uh, uh, the whole thing is a uh, is a you know is a, a setup, and that uh, you know there's there's more to it than just the sighting of a uh, of a strange object that nobody can explain. Mm-hmm. Well, I would say the the missile test. I would say with near certainty, as far as I'm concerned, was some sort of a mass was a test of mass public response. Exactly. You know the 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 way that they did it. You know he he selected the wrong <clears throat> drop down box. Then for 45 minutes, he went and walked around and had some coffee and forgot about it. Even though the alert would have gone out to his cell phone, every member of his family's cell phone, their TVs, they'd call him on the telephone, and he didn't bother to to fix it for 45 minutes. I yeah, we, and we get we we get this ridiculous explanation as we always do when there's a massive cover up like yeah. that. It's like the weather balloon. Roswell was a weather balloon, right? It's like right. this was a a careless mistake. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And we get the same careless mistake in Japan. Um, and how many people do you think believe that it was really a mis- I, Are people so conditioned and mind controlled that they accept that ex- explanation? You know, my philosophy professor, I think he had a really good way of putting it, but he said, you know, I'm, I'm from the Bay Area, so excuse the sports team, but he said that, mm. that most people, you know, are content, probably 80 or 90% of the population are content with a six pack of the 49ers. So as long as they have their six pack in their football game, that they're they're fairly content with existence. You know, mm-hmm. we were talking about the the allegory of the cave and the notion that you know you're watching the shadows go by and the shadows kind of can't figure out how to get out of the cave. They're trapped in there, but the door is right there and they can't see it. So I think I think probably most people are conditioned to <clears throat> to you know, take whatever they say at face value. I mean, the CIA themselves have put quite a bit of effort into you know being able to to manipulate media around the world. I forget the name of the um, CIA project offhand, but they actually had a project to co-opt, you know, reporters and (laughs) broadcast news. And, you know, so I think most people are fairly content with that. And, And you can see it in other ways, right? That, you know, as a society, we're fed this notion that of the American dream, you know, go get a new car, buy a house, you know, do this, do that. Well, we all try to pursue it. And, you know, some people, it causes them to live beyond their means. But, you know, we're conditioned um, societally to want that and to desire it and to demand it. You know, we, we were conditioned that everybody should go to college. Should everybody go to college? We can debate that. But we were conditioned that everybody has to. And now you have people with degrees that work at Starbucks because, you know, their particular majors like my own <laughs> were not very useful. <laughs> You know, my, my major is one of those not very useful ones, but, you know, I went because <laughs> I was expected to. So I, I think that there's a lot of conditioning that goes on. And I think that that in a lot of ways that, you know, people generally, for the most part, uh, believe what they're fed. So. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, uh, uh, if I could uh, jump in for a minute. And sure, go for it. You, you, you make the point of that, you know, most people settle for doing what's expected of them which I think is certainly true. But uh, one of the things that I think that our new book does, Blowing America's Mind, um, is it takes you through the process where you're going from being manipulated and controlled (laughs) and you're a guinea pig in a spider web that's much larger than you and you can't see all the dimensions of it, to the awakening of a rebellious spirit inside you uh, where you have a tremendous urge to break free of that. And that's where the battle goes on between the attempt to reassert the hypnotic control over the subject 
and the subject's determination to reject it all and to pull out and even be toward destructive toward the uh, the controlling uh, psychiatrists. And that's what you see happen in Blowing America's Mind, especially with my co-author, John Selby, who reached a point where, uh, you know, he wasn't going to take it anymore. And he was absolutely determined to get into the Institute files, even if it meant breaking into those file cabinets and finding his own file and getting to the truth of what was going on and then uh, turning against it all and warning me, warning me, um, who I was completely sold on it at that point and warning me to, um, to get out of that program, get out while I could before, you know, I was so manipulated and controlled and weakened will that they, they have you in their pocket at that point. So it takes you all the way from the beginning of the naive introduction and getting sucked in and trapped in the spider web to asserting your own will. And at that point, the I think that the being a part of the project has actually done you some good because you've become strong enough to get rid of those things that are the controls on you. And for both John Selby and I, that's what happened in our own lives. By breaking free of the Institute and finding who we were, we went after the lives that we wanted to live, whether it was for him writing all those books or for me making all those films. Wouldn't have happened if we hadn't have had this fight at the Well, unfortunately, uh, we're coming up on an institute that uh, we cannot break. And uh, so when we uh, come back, we will continue this conversation on exploring the design. Now back to exploring the bizarre with two of the most electrifying researchers in the paranormal, your hosts, Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz. I'm downloading you. I'm Professor Hack, hard drive of the techno-geek kind. I'm a computer nerd, a little out of my mind. With you, I'm infatuated. And I'm so exasperated. Obsessed to the max. Hey, I'll send you a fax. Because my email won't work. You must think I'm a jerk. But you're really so dear, darling. It's you I need near. So I'm downloading you, sweetheart. Yeah, I'm downloading you. My laptop's here, you have nothing to fear. They say it just tickles as I download your pixels. With you in my laptop, I'll always have you. Try to escape me, you'll see what I do. 900 gigabytes, that's what you are. Your brain and your fame and your face, you're a star. So I am downloading you, my sweetheart. Yeah, I'm downloading you. I'm Professor Hack, hard drive of the techno geek kind, a computer nerd, a little out of my mind. I won't clone you, I won't phone you, and I won't be pissed. But with you, darling, in my laptop, hey, I'll never rest. On Mondays and Thursdays, I'll clean up your file. On Tuesdays and Fridays, you'll defrag for a while. On Sundays and Wednesdays, I'll debug your hair. Holidays and Saturdays, you'll be my software, because I'm downloading you. Darling, yeah, I'm downloading you. All right, <laughs> more hack hard drive here on exploring the bazaar. So, Paul, what's the uh, what was the inspiration for that one? Well, that's my uh, alter ego of the uh, you know the uh, the uh, demonic uh, male uh, motivation is kind of taken to the max. If you could uh, take the object of your erotic desires and control her to the extent that you could download her into your computer, and <laughs> Turn her into a series of uh, <clears throat> pixels that you completely control. So it's kind of the ultimate male chauvinist fantasy there. Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, how <laughs> how how far away are we from that actually happening, though? Uh, well, we're not far away at all because uh, I mean, you, you talk about uh, about beers and uh, and and the football games as being all it takes to uh, satisfy the males of America now, but. Pornography is so prevalent and so free 
that uh, I'm beginning to think that that's part of the mind control plot too, right? Mm-hmm. 24-7, <laughs> anything you want, you anytime. Know huh? You know, it's, you know what's interesting is that a lot, that when you look at pornography, that a lot of the um, <clears throat> kind of technological leaps we make, you know, they're either military or pornography, right? You know, they right. were some of the first people to stream video. You know, they were the first, some of the first people to go to straight digital digital editing. You know, so they invest a lot of money in it. <laughs> it's a multi billion dollar industry. So yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. And actually, what's interesting is that you played that song. You know, I was watching the X Files last night, and that was the whole thing. Or the actually not last night, but the last week. You know, they had taken one of the lone gunmen and loaded him into you know a kind of matrix kind of thing. So, you know, quantum computing is all we really need to do it. Mm-hmm. We're there. So well, I mean, considering be they're trying to go ahead, Oliver. Finish your sentence. There. I'm sorry. Well, I was gonna, I was gonna say, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they're actively trying to do it. Well, considering uh, the, the the great leap that has taken place with the internet, I mean, I, I mean, I can I can remember it not that long ago, you know, the late nineteen eighties, really. Uh, most of us had never heard of the internet, and and in just this short period of time, how it has become so prevalent and so um, really, so I mean, it's. In people's lives, in their lives. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's such a control factor in everybody's lives now. So in the same amount of time in the future, you know, what is going to be the next thing that, I mean, that, that you know, we're not even thinking about now. And yet, you know, like our kids are going to be like, oh, dad, you know, <laughs> you're, you're so out of it. <laughs> well, I would say probably a, a virtual world. Because humans, humans as as a species, you know, we have a, we definitely have a, a kind of <clears throat> slant toward escapism. Mm-hmm. And if you had some sort of a virtual space, you know, now you're no longer, um, you know, you're no longer Tim. You're whatever you want to be. You know, you could be a wolf or a dragon or whatever, a woman or a man or <laughs> whatever you want. And now you're starting to see VR goggles that can attach to cell phones. And, you know, they, they kind of finally nipped that thing. They thought they were going to do it back in the 90s. And, you know, in the late 90s, you had this, you know, these virtual worlds that popped up. And they kind of didn't cut it because you had to, you know, you had, still had to sit in front of the computer with a mouse and guide the avatar around. Right. But, you know, we're fast approaching a point where that's no longer going to happen. And you're you're rapidly heading toward you know the kind of cyberpunk kind of scenario where you can jack yourself in, you can plug yourself into a car, plug yourself into a TV, plug yourself into a you know into a computer, and then dump yourself out onto this virtualized world. So I'd probably say in the next ten or ten years, for sure, we'll, we'll probably have it. Yeah. Now, see, now there we <laughs> here. Here we've been talking about you know this entire this entire evening about you know mind manipulation and all that. That is like the ultimate wet dream, I would think, of a lot of these uh, people who would just love to control the population. Uh, you know, you have people in a virtual world that, uh, you know, I mean, you can you can control these people it's so easily without them ever knowing it. Well, and, and you look at, you can see some of the outliers now, right? You have a lot of, you know, quantum mathematicians physicists, theorists that are arguing, are we in a matrix now? Right. Can we see these glitches, these ideas that we have, you know, about synchronicity? And are those indicators that we're actually in some sort of a virtualized world today? Mm-hmm. So the fact that these thinkers who are usually out on the, on the edge, you know, they're like, I'm, a, I'm an engineer, right? And I work on this kind of stuff. And you know, we're we're very rooted in today, in today, trying to make our applications do whatever. But those guys way out on the edge, you know, they're the ones that are kind of the prophets of the future. You know, and they're they're seeing that, and they're starting to argue. Well, maybe we're in a, a virtualized world right now as we speak, and the fact that they're putting effort and time into thinking down that path then that indicates that somebody somewhere is moving in that direction 
Otherwise, they wouldn't bother. They'd go theorize on how, how soon we'll be able to go to Barnard Star or Alpha Centauri. Well, they gave up on that. <laughs> and now it's all about the matrix and creating a matrix kind of, you know, kind of setup. So I would say we're, we're definitely marching there. And we already have, you know, the rudimentary elements of quantum computing. And that's the kind of power that you need to do this kind of thing. You can't do this on, on a dual 10 core machine with a terabyte of RAM. It's not going to cut it. You know, you need to push beyond that and be able to, to use like cell processors and other things where, you know, you can chain together thousands and millions of these processors together to parallel, parallel compute. So, but, you know, we have the, we have the basic technology to achieve some level of it. It's just polygonal and kind of, kind of 1990s ish, but we're, we're definitely heading down that road. Well, at least, uh, at least civilian based <laughs> is. Uh, I sure. mean, I, and, I mean, we, we, yeah, I mean, we've talked about this before, you know, when it comes to, you know, like uh, uh, secret aircraft and things like that, that, you know, the military is probably at least 50 years ahead of uh, civilians. So when it comes to just what we were talking about, you know, what is yeah. being used and hiding in the wings that, uh, that we have no idea. <laughs> It's impossible to tell with DARPA. You, you'll never figure it out. It's too compartmentalized, and yeah, I mean, not only you know, you, you not, on, not only is it compartmentalized, uh, uh, but um, disinformation is a huge industry in and of itself too. Right. So they protect the compartmentalization by, you know, the expression that's popular is fake news. Well, the the fake story that has the grain of truth in it is something that those of us interested in UFOs have been suffering with for you know, half a century easily, right? Um, and uh, that disinformation industry, uh, the number of people involved in concocting false stories, again, to manipulate public perception. Why are they so completely <laughs> intent on manipulating what the public thinks and believes? It's it's fun the fundamentals of population control and it goes back with its germination and the kind of uh, mind control experimentation we're talking about in blowing america's mind back to the most rudimentary days of it uh, starting in the 1950s and and the use of drugs and the techniques today are so much more sophisticated take spying for example Take this as an example. Mm -hmm. Wiretapping used to be an industry in itself. There were professional wiretappers, some that worked for the mob, let's say. And they'd have a target, and they'd have to get into a house, and they'd have to plant a bug. and They'd have to do it when they could have access, when nobody would be there. They'd have to try to do it in a way that it couldn't be detective, uh, detected. Uh, you know, they had to wire a house, or they had to wire a phone. In the wireless era we live in today, nobody has to do that anymore. I mean, it would be absurd to think that you've got to go plant a bug on someone when everyone is carrying that bug around in their pocket and it's their cell phone. It's the ultimate spy device. You know? Yeah, you can turn you, it on, set it to record, turn the camera it, on, laptop, you can cell be phone, heard. TVs. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. I, I mean, how many people have the habit of putting a piece of tape over the camera lens on their computer, you know, am I the only one, you know, I who do no, you I know, do just as assumes that they can use it to look into your room or spy on you at any time. And all this myth about, oh, they need a court order, right? They yeah. need, you know, need to go and get a court order to be able to uh, listen in on that conversation or read that email. It's like, you have to say, well, give me a break. You know, yeah, if the government isn't that. doing it, the hackers are doing it, right? They <laughs> yeah, have it down right. to a well, science. There's, there's also a funny thing about that is that they only need that if the communication takes place inside the United States. The minute that you send an email that, that goes somewhere outside the United States, you no longer need any of that stuff. They can just they have, it up. They have, the per, they have the permission by law to uh, listen in on any of it you know, and track sure. anyone. And I mean, there's a famous story um, about the AT&T facility back in the 90s where this guy, it was in Wired, and this network engineer had found this cable <clears throat> attached to one of the core switches where all the data was passing through. 
and he traced this thing and traced this thing and traced this thing. And eventually, you know, he came upon a box that nobody could explain that was marked property of the U.S. government. You know, and it, that was basically carnivore. It was intercepting all the all the web traffic and then analyzing where it was going and what it was doing. You know, so, I mean, these, these things in echelon, <laughs> you know, they listen to the cell phone calls, pick this stuff up off the satellites. I mean, it's it's been pervasive for 20 years. For sure. Yeah, it, it's, the, it's the black world of uh, what they call intelligence. Well, and that, well, you know, it, that, go ahead. It's Olaf, the I'm deep sorry. politics. It's the deep state, too, right? That it's not it's not just the black world. The, the black world is the intelligence and espionage communities are are controlled and managed by the deep state. So really, if you want to understand where these things are going and what they're doing and why you have to look at the deep state. So you have to not look at the director of the CIA who's an appointee. You need to look at the, you know, assistant directors who've been there for 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and you need to look at these guys who are career, you know, career deep, deep state um, operatives. You know, I want to, I want to raise an issue about the deep state operative because there's a perfect example in a film that's out uh, now uh, called Mark Felt, mm -hmm. who was Deep Throat of Watergate. And, you know, he was a career uh, official at the FBI. <laughs> you know, he had survived for, you know, decades. People came and went, but Mark Felt was always there. And, uh, you know, they were, they couldn't get rid of him. They were afraid of him. You know, he, he knew too much. And at a certain point, he decided to turn against Richard Nixon. And he contacted uh, Woodward and Bernstein, and he began guiding them through everything they needed to know in order to unravel the mystery of Watergate and bring down the Nixon administration. It was done by one of those career FBI guys from the inside. And it, it's a similar thing with some of the other whistleblowers where, uh, you know, it, somebody, uh, you know, inside the intelligence world that like my professor hack hard drive uh song the wikileaks song you know a one one thumb drive into the the hands of somebody who's going to expose it you know can do a uh, a lot of damage to those that are trying to keep all these things a secret but sometimes it's the sure. only way that the public can even get a glimpse into what kinds of things are being manipulated and controlled I mean, it was a shock to the whole public, wasn't it, to uh, learn that uh, that their their phone calls were all being uh, monitored. Mm -hmm. you know, well, well, and that's that's just it, though. I mean, you know, right now we kind of we live in an age where these kind of revelations, the uh, the whistleblowers are then demonized. You know, yeah. just like, oh, my God, this person is just, I mean, you just might as well invite, you know, Russia to uh, pull their tanks up into up to the White House. You know, this guy has just damaged uh, our national security to the point where uh, of no return. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. So um, uh, and we only have uh, really um, about uh, less than 10 minutes uh, of the show. But I wanted to ask you real quick, Paul. Um is there any aspect of what happened uh, uh, to you, you know, in Princeton that you left with with really no memory? Because you know, I'm and I'm referring to the press release uh, uh, you know, about your book that uh, it said that it took the authors 50 years to decondition their own minds to remember what was done to them at the Institute in Princeton. So, I mean, uh, are, are you being literal with that, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, years you know, later? That, yeah, that's not, that's not so literal for me. Uh, John, John Selby has felt through the decades that things have come back to him at, mm -hmm. at different times that have uh, been buried and then have come to the surface and the process of unraveling all of those conditions uh, that were blocked out was a long and difficult, uh, you know, sort of a spider web. Uh, I, I felt, and of course he was in the program longer than I was. He right. was sucked in deeper. He suffered more than I did. I got out sooner, you know, before the damage was uh, done, let's say. Um, 
But uh, I felt in working with John Selby during on Blowing America's Mind during those first few years after we were free of the Institute, that we unraveled most of it. And there was a lot that never needed to be unraveled, of course, because the relationships with uh, Dr. Um, uh, Bernard Aronson, the head hypnotist, uh, these were conscious memories. Uh, and a lot of what was done to us was a, a conscious or came back in flashbacks. When we call this, the book A True Story, the subtitle of Blowing America's Mind is A True Story of Princeton, CIA Mind Control, LSD, and Zen. The Zen part of it we didn't talk about, but John Selby, who grew up on a cattle ranch, was a he became, you know, he was a cowboy in Princeton, fish out of water, you know, very far from being a, an Ivy League type. And uh, he was interested in fencing. He became a championship Ivy League fencer. And he sort of uh, adopted what he called the Zen technique of fencing. From hypnosis, he had learned about concentrating the mind completely on the present. Some of the hypnotic conditions would take away the future. They would take away the past. He had his own past, lots of chunks of it, just blocked out and obliterated. It would have made him a better fencer, the whole Zen technique of concentrating just on the present, uh, like a deer in the woods that hears a rifle click mm -hmm. uh, and, and knows it's threatened. But the hypnotic conditions came back to haunt him while he was uh, fencing in ways that, 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 you know, I don't want too many spoilers, you know, to give away too much, but, you know, but it, just to say that these things were destructive, uh, uh, destructive to him. So, <clears throat> yes, there was that unraveling process. I think most of it happened in the first couple of years. I wanted to make this as my first film. <clears throat> when I finished at the American Film Institute, I had hoped this would be my first production. It wasn't, you know, it's all these 50 years later, just about, you know, I'm 70 now. I've made, you know, like 11 films and, uh, you know, the first that there was Timothy Leary's Dead and Starry Night, and The Artist and the Shaman and The Sci-Fi Boys uh, and Jesus in India and The Life After Death Project and Before We Say Goodbye and Marilyn Monroe Declassified. There's all these different uh, projects in Roswell, many of them controversial, but I, I couldn't get this finished. I couldn't get it uh, made. Why not finished? Yes, there was continuing blocking that made it hard to tie it all up and make it a finished package. We finally did that last year. It was our number one on our bucket list. We said, you know, we're not kids anymore. Is this gonna, is this gonna die gathering dust in a drawer? blowing America's mind, or are we going to finish it and release it to the world? So now, Tim, we've released it to the world. Anybody can find it on Amazon. You can find it as a printed book. You can find it as a Kindle book. You can find it as a, a PDF file or any other kind of ebook reader. It's out there, and it's out in other countries. Maybe not the printed book in other countries, but I go online and I see, wow, they've got it in Japan. They've got it in England. They've got it in Australia. Uh, I see websites with talking about blowing America's mind and it's all in other language and I don't even know what the language is. So we've done the job of putting it out there to the world. Now we need the response from the world to take a look, you know, have the experience, read it. We've worked so hard to get it to you. You know, it's at your fingertips. So that's my pitch tonight. That's why I'm here. I'm <laughs> oh, that's my a good new book. That's yeah. a good pitch, and I'm and I'm glad you got the book out there. And unfortunately, we are almost out of time, so um, I want to give you guys just a, a, a real quick chance to let our listeners know a little bit more about uh, you know where they can find out about you. Uh, Olav, I'll start with you. Uh, pretty much everything is at paranoiamagazine.com. Do you uh, have any uh, uh, new projects that are uh, coming out that uh, we should uh, watch out for? Yeah, uh, Paranoia Publishing just released a new uh, geoengineering book um, with, that's a, a series of articles written by Clyde Lewis. Um, we're still going to, we have an issue that's near complete uh, that we need to get out. Um, it's been near complete for a while, but we got sidetracked on other stuff. Um, we're doing some uh, 
some books that are that are kind of collections of articles about various topics. Um, we released one on covert space warfare, which was a collection of uh, articles written in paranoia about, you know, covert space operations and other things. Um, so we're always kind of we always have a few irons in the fire. We're bringing mm-hmm. the podcast back. Oh, fantastic! All right, okay. And yeah. uh, uh, Paul, what's the uh, what's the website uh, for uh, well, the uh, book. blowing America's mind? Yeah, it's easy to remember. It's blowingamericasmind.com. And that's a good uh, center for additional information about uh, mind control, psychedelic research today. It's kind of our central headquarters now around our new book. But also pauldavids.com as my movies, uh, pauldavids-artist.com, or go to the Internet uh, movie database imdb.com Paul Davids you can track all my different films TV all shows. right well gentlemen thank you very much for being with us tonight on exploring the bizarre as always a fascinating program and to everyone out there thank you for listening and we'll see you next time we're on so good night you've been listening to exploring the bizarre with hosts Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz We're taking back the night by jetting non-stop across the cosmos in search of the truly bizarre and totally unexplained, with you as their co-pilot. Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern, on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. For more information on exploring the bizarre, and hosts Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz, check out their KCOR Digital Radio Network page. Follow their YouTube channel at MRUFO1100. Exploring the bizarre.